Good afternoon. Uh, today in Stockholm, the Secretary General met with Prime Minister Magdalena Andersson, and he thanked Sweden for its steadfast support of the United Nations and multilateralism through the years. In a joint encounter uh, early this morning, the Secretary General noted Sweden's trailblazing role in gender equality and its championing of climate action and sustainable development, among other accomplishments. He said that we have, he, Secretary General also noted that we have two UN teams led by Martin Griffiths and Rebecca Greenspan to help find a package deal involving the safe and secure export of Ukrainian produced food through the Black Sea, along with unimpeded access of Russian food and fertilizers to global markets, especially in developing countries. The Secretary General urged countries who are planning to cut official development assistance to reconsider their stance as these cuts will have dire consequences on the lives of the most vulnerable. When asked about Michel Bachelet's recent trip to China, the Secretary General reiterated his full confidence in the High Commissioner for Human Rights. He also referred to the Stockholm Plus 50 conference, which starts tomorrow, as a crucial opportunity to bolster our response to the triple planetary emergency of climate disruption, pollution, and biodiversity loss. He called on countries to show greater solidarity, deeper cooperation, higher ambitions, more urgency, and stronger leadership today to address these crises. Uh, the Secretary General also met today with the High Level Advisory Board on Multilateralism in Uppsala, and he also visited the gravesite of our former Secretary General, Dag Hammarskjöld. Tomorrow, he will speak at the opening of the Stockholm Plus 50 conference and on the margin meet with other leaders as well as the Stockholm Plus 50 Youth Task Force. And a number of events are underway in uh, Sweden ahead of the of official opening of the conference, uh, which will continue through Friday. 6,000 people have now been registered to attend in person, including 10 heads of states or government, 110 ministers and 140 from 146 participating member states. Uh, some Wednesday highlights include the second day of the Youth Assembly, the UN Science Policy Business Forum on the Environment, the One Planet Network Forum, and a high-level meeting of the Basel, Rotterdam, and Stockholm conventions. Also happening is the Peace for the Planet concert in the King's Park. I won't try to say that in Swedish. Uh, with participation from UNEP's Goodwill Ambassador Ellie Goulding and Grammy Award winner Ricky Cage, among others. Turning to Mali, uh, this morning a UN peacekeeping logistics convoy was attacked near the town of Kidal in the northern part of Mali. For about an hour, the convoy was under direct fire from suspected members of a terrorist groups who were using small arms and rocket launchers. Four UN peacekeepers from Jordan were injured, and sadly, one of them succumbed to his injuries after being evacuated. We will have a formal statement, but I can, of course, tell you that the Secretary General strongly condemns this attack and sends his deepest condolences to the family of the peacekeeper who died and the people and government of Jordan. He wishes a prompt recovery to those injured. Uh, the peacekeeping mission said this attack was the fifth incident to occur in the Kidal region in just one week. It is a tragic reminder of the complexity of the mandate of the UN mission and of its peacekeepers and of the threats that peacekeepers face on a daily basis. In a statement, Mr., uh, the special representative of the Secretary General in Mali, El Ghassim Wane, underlined that despite the difficulties, the mission remains determined to support the people and the government of Mali in their quest for peace and security. Uh, turning to the Democratic uh, Republic of the Congo, the head of the UN peacekeeping mission in that country, Bintu Keita, has been in Goma for the last 10 days, leading efforts alongside the Congolese army to respond to attacks by the M23 in the Ruchuru and uh, Nyarogongo areas. During a press conference in Goma today, she called for a de-escalation. Ms. Keita also noted that while the Congolese armed forces and the UN mission have managed to restore a relative calm in the two territories, a comprehensive approach is urgently needed to resolve the M23 problem once and for all. 
She said that the UN mission would support the Democratic Republic of the Congo and countries in the region with the political process facilitated by Kenya, making sure of existing regional mechanisms. She stressed the importance of effective demobilization and reintegration programs for ex-combatants in the country and reiterated the peacekeeping mission's determination to continue all necessary, um, all necessary means to support the Congolese armed forces to neutralize the armed groups and, of course, to protect civilians. And you will see that the Congo was on the agenda of the Security Council yesterday afternoon. In his remarks, Huang Xia, the special envoy of the Secretary General for the Great Lakes region, urged council members to do everything to avoid a new escalation in the eastern part of the country and to avoid yet another crisis with Im uh, immeasurable humanitarian security and political consequences for the Great Lakes region. For her part, Martha Poby, the Assistant Secretary General for Africa, said it is imperative that this council lend its full weight to ongoing regional efforts to defuse the situation and bring an end to the M23 insurgency. From the, its northern neighbor, the Central African Republic, our humanitarian colleagues are telling us that between January and May of this year, aid workers have been impacted by 69 security incidents. One humanitarian worker has been killed while 16 others have been injured. The humanitarian coordinator in the country, Denise Brown, strongly condemned these attacks, some of which have led to the suspension of humanitarian activities. There were four attacks against aid workers in one week alone, forcing two humanitarian organizations to suspend their activities. This hindered the delivery of aid to more than 46,000 vulnerable men, women, and children, most of whom were internally displaced in the northwest of the Central African Republic. Ms. Brown stressed that civilians are the most affected by the disturbing increase in violence. She added that every time a humanitarian organization is attacked, access to water, food, health care, and education is threatened in a context where more than half of the population needs humanitarian assistance. Ms. Brown called on all parties to respect their obligations under international humanitarian law and to allow humanitarian organizations free pa passage. Moving on to Yemen, uh, I can tell you that we welcome the first commercial flights from Sana Airport to Cairo earlier today. This was the seventh flight operating under the terms of the UN brokered two months nationwide truce and represents an important element of the truce. A total of 2,495 Yemenis have traveled so far between Sana, Amman, and Cairo. We thank the government of Egypt for its invaluable support in bringing about the important achievement and to the government of Yemen for their constructive role in making this possible. Despite the good news today on the Cairo flights and the improved humanitarian situation the truce has delivered over the last two months, we must be clear that the humanitarian needs for Yemen remain high. Some 19 million people will go hungry this year, including more than 160,000 who will face famine-like conditions. More than 4 million people have been displaced since the war started. Severe needs persist across all sectors. Aid agencies need 4.28 billion U.S. dollars to assist 17.3 million people across the country this year. So far, only 26 percent of that amount has been funded. This means that core programs like food assistance, health care, and other activities are scaling back when they should be expanding. We urge donors to pledge and to convert those pledges to cash. And turning to Ukraine today, the UN Children's Fund warned that nearly 100 days, um, that nearly 100 days of war in Ukraine have wrought devastating consequences for children at a scale and speed not seen since the Second World War. According to UNICEF, 3 million children in inside Ukraine and more than 2.2 million children in refugee hosting countries are now in need of humanitarian assistance. UNICEF notes that based on reports verified by the UN's Human Rights Office, an average of more than two children are killed and more than four injured every day in the conflict in Ukraine. Civilian infrastructure, which children depend on, continues to be damaged or destroyed. UNICEF and its partners have distributed life-saving health and medical supplies for nearly 2.1 million people in war-affected areas, enabled access to safe water for more than 2.1 million people, and providing learning supplies to more than 290,000 children. Uh, moving 
to Asia from Myanmar, our humanitarian colleagues are telling us that the number of internally displaced men, women, and children in that country have now exceeded one million. This includes some 700,000 people displaced by fighting and insecurity since the military takeover in February of last year. In addition, some nearly 40,000 people from Myanmar are currently displaced in neighboring India and Thailand. Since April of this year, the monsoons have damaged shelters for internally displaced people who were already living in difficult conditions in Rakhine, Kashin, Southern Shan, and Kain states. Aid agencies and their local partners are working to provide displaced people and host communities with food, clean water, shelter, medicines, hygiene kits, COVID-19 preventive items, protection services, and other essential services. Uh, and during the first quarter of 2022, aid workers reached 2.6 million people, despite difficulties with access as limited funding. To reach all of the 6.2 million people in Myanmar who need humanitarian aid, we need improved access, the removal of bottlenecks such as visa delays, banking restrictions, and of course, increased funding. Speeding of fun speaking of funding, to date, only 10% of the 826 million we've asked for for the 2022 humanitarian response plan has been received. Inflation in the prices for food, fuel, shelter materials, and other items has further limited our operations. We call again on donors to give generously to save and protect the lives of women, men, and children. And a quick note from the Lao People's Demo Democratic Republic. Uh, our team, our UN team there, uh, is supporting the country in face of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, led by the resident coordinator, Sarah Sekines. Uh, they are working with the government to boost development financing, trade, decent work, and green growth, among other areas. The UN Development Program is working with the government on sustainability restoring, uh, sustainably restoring the tourism sector. For its part, UNICEF and UNESCO are working to help to improve education standards by addressing learning gaps resulting from the pandemic. And the International Organization for Migration has reached more than 50,000 people with information on safe migration, access to work, and education for returnees. And on the vaccine front, more than 11.2 million COVAX-19 vaccines, two-thirds of which came Excuse me, uh, let's try this again. Uh, more than 11.2 million COVID-19 vaccines, two-thirds of which came through COVAX, have been administered in the country across 18 provinces to 80% of the people who are age 12 and above. Uh, two reports to flag for you, um, which found that during the COVID-19 pandemic, renewable energy was the only energy source to grow, despite disruptions to economic, uh, economies and supply chains. However, progress on achieving the seventh sustainable development goal, which is ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all, has been slowed by the pandemic. Globally, 733 million people still have no access to electricity. 2.4 billion people still cook using fuels detrimental to their health and the environment. And nearly 90 people in Asia and Africa who have previously gained access to electricity can no longer afford to pay for basic energy needs. The impact of the COVID-19 crisis on energy has been compounded recently by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which led to uncertainty in global oil and gas markets and has sent energy prices soaring. As we know, those reports are available online. I want to end with a few pieces of good news. Um, the security chief here at headquarters, who I just spoke to a short while ago, confirmed that we are going back to the status quo antebellum in terms of access of resident correspondence to this venerable building. That's okay. Uh, we're going back to access um, status quo antebellum, uh, so resident correspondents will just need to present their card at the 43rd Street uh, entrance. Uh, no questions asked, no emails, no prior notification. Um, you're free to work whenever you want, however you want. You're also free to write and say what you want. Um, and, but for non-resident, if you need to bring in non-resident correspondence, that you will have to go through Malu as you did in the past. Other piece of good news, uh, we're going to help you spend your money. The uh, gift shop is now reopened as of today in the... Um, 
in the basement just in time for uh, Christmas, Father's Day, whatever. Um, so, uh, and then I have a message to my children because today is the Global Day of Parents. Uh, and in a tweet, the Secretary General said that being a parent has been one of the most fulfilling experiences of his life. The Secretary General salutes all parents for their commitment to nurture and protect their children in a peaceful and healthy world. Um, and then we thank Libya for their full contribution to the regular budget. We're now at 104. And as you know, 1230, the ambassador of Albania, uh, Ferit Hoksha, will be here as he will preside, or he's already presiding over the Security Council. Edi. Uh, Steph, first, um, I'm sure on behalf of Anka, like to thank you for your work in getting the restrictions on access over the weekend lifted. I know all of us are very happy about that. Um, <laughs> two two follow-ups. First, on Mali, um, four peacekeepers were injured. One of them died. Is there any information on whether any of the attackers were um, wounded, hurt, or whatever? Did they flee? No, I mean they're they're still doing. Uh, our colleagues are still doing an assessment of the of the situation of what and, and of the of what happened in the attack. And a follow up on Yemen. Uh, the first flight from Sana to Cairo. I assume it's going to come back. Yes, it, the plan, yeah, it's a, it's a, you can get it's a round, round trip. trip. Yes, it's a round trip ticket, yes. <laughs> and uh, second, Fully um, refundable, <laughs> no doubt. Uh, secondly, is there any update on um, efforts to extend the truce and on the start of uh, the operation to transfer oil from the safer tanker. Okay, so no update on safer tanker, but we'll we'll check uh, with our team see if there's anything we'd say. Mr. Hans Grunberg is involved in intense work on um, ensuring the renewal of the truce, and you know we've received preliminary. Uh, positive indications from the parties at this point. So as soon as we have something more concrete. We will share with you, Abdel Hamid. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Today, a young Palestinian journalist, her name is Ghufran Harun Hamid Warasna, was shot dead in the, uh, in the refugee camp of Arub near Hebron. Have you heard of the news, I, and did you, I had did you not, have any I had, language on that? I had not seen that uh, report. If that is, in fact, confirmed, we, of course, sent our condolences to her family and her her colleagues uh, and, and we'll, lo we'll look into the incident. I just hadn't seen it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, sorry, go, go ahead. Uh, go, go ahead. Um, Stefan, uh, going back to Mali, it's normally the work of the government to protect the peacekeepers. So where were they? And why did they protect them five times? Because you said that they were attacked five times? Well, it, it is, let, let's, uh, the, the government has its responsibilities. We, we do not rely on the Malian armed forces to provide security for all of our convoys or operations. So who is protecting the-, the Well, I mean, the, the peacekeepers, uh, as we've seen in many operations, fight back. Uh, but this is just a, 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 a symptom of uh, the lack of progress that we have seen- uh, What about Wagner? Seen, that we have seen in, in Mali. Uh, on the bilateral forces, uh, I think I would refer you to uh, the- I would refer you to the, the recent human rights report, which I think was pretty clear. Madame. Please, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, just wait for the mic to press the button and wait for the red light to go okay. on. Yeah. Uh, I'm Salah from Azerbaijan News Agency Report. Uh, as you know, anti-government demonstration have been taking place uh, since April in Armenia, in Yerevan. Uh, 
according to many news outlets, police uh, used excessive force against protesters and detained some of them. Uh, my question is, what's the UN position in this situation? I mean, I, we'll, we'll check on the reports you mentioned. Our position for any country is that people be allowed to demonstrate uh, peacefully, but we'll look specifically at those reports. Edward and... Hi, uh, Stefan. Today, uh, the Secretary General mentioned that all parties would agree to have a quadrilateral meeting between Russia, Ukraine, UN, and Turkey. Uh, j j just want to have just want to have have a, a detailed, uh, more detailed uh, information on this. Uh, has has the the date or the um, the location has been, been confirmed no. on on this no. one? If, if, if there would be this meeting, will Secretary General be attending? Uh, there's a lot of ifs, uh, and as soon as ifs are confirmed, we will confirm the ifs. <laughs> but, but actually, yeah, you know, the Secretary General said uh, it seems like there's a confirmation. Yeah, I mean, it, it, again, I mean I, the sec what the Secretary, you know, my job's pretty simple. The Secretary General says it, it's true. So. You can refer to what the Secretary General said, uh, but things are not, not once, I mean, I, I think that the whole, his whole approach to this very important project that he's been very much focused on really since uh, the start of the visit first to Moscow and then to Kiev is to just confirm things as they are confirmed. There's a lot of chatter, there's a lot of people talking about things. Once things are confirmed, we will do so. Okay, so my second question. You mentioned today is the internet, uh, the parent day. Mm -hmm. Today is actually also uh, Children's Day in over 40 countries all over the world, including Ukraine and Russia. Uh, is there anything the Secretary General would, would like to say to those children's, uh, children in, 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 in Ukraine or in... Well, I mean, in, in Ukraine, we, we, I would refer you to what I just said, what UNICEF's report on, on, the, uh, on, on the overwhelming... Uh, on the suffering that the children in Ukraine have been uh, have been have been under uh, since the start of the conflict. Bitul. Thank you, Steph. I'll follow up on Yemen. Uh, has the UN received the full funding, which is, I believe, eighty million dollars, to offload the Safar oil tanker? No, and we've been hearing warnings for over a year that it's very urgent that it oil tanker needs to be offloaded. And uh, if you haven't received the full funding, uh, earlier it was $40 million. Why can't the UN just use some emergency funding I mean, it has to offload it if it is very the, urgent? The, first of all, you know, the, it's kind of like renova doing renovation in your apartment in New York, right? The longer you wait, <laughs> the higher the costs. So we've been talking about this for a long time. It probably could have been done with less money a few years ago. The costs are higher. I mean, we see inflation throughout the world. Uh, this is not an operation that can be done half in, in, a, in a half half measure. We need to have the money to hire the technical teams, to hire you know the, the specialists that can do this and can do it uh, and can do it safely. Uh, how much more is needed? Uh, I'll get you the... the I, mean, I know we don't have the full amount, but I will get you that figure. And if the operation is done, if the uh, tanker is offloaded, what will happen to the oil? Uh, the, the oil will be transferred... If I recall what David Gressley said here, the oil will be transferred to a new, uh, uh, a new storage facility offshore in a ship as well. So the oil will stay. It is being. It will be transferred to a safer. Uh, too bad that's uh, to, to to a more safe <laughs> holding uh, vessel. Are there plans to use it for the humanitarian purposes in Yemen, or will it just stay there as I, it is? At this, you know, I, it, it involves having all the parties agree. Uh, this is what they've agreed to for the time being. Ms. Salome. Um, apologies if this has been shared before, but I, we heard the Secretary General again today expressing concern about development aid being cut mm -hmm. because of rising prices yeah. around the world and so on and so forth. Has he? How, do you know how many countries he's heard this from, or how much 
of a loss this could be for? Is there any way to quantify what, yes, what the event's looking at? Yes, I mean, it's, it's a, I would say it's a movement. We've seen it in a number of, uh, of countries. Uh, we said proposed by Norway. We said it uh, also to a certain extent in the UK and others. Uh, but we can get you a, a tabulation of, uh, of those numbers. Pam and then Evelyn. Uh, thanks, Steph, and sorry to have walked by the front. Um, uh, my question is just about Rebecca Grinspan. Um, is there any update on, she's in Washington, mm -hmm. right? Came from Moscow. Mm -hmm. And is she coming to New York? Will she have any kind of UNCTAD UN uh, meetings? We, 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 may, uh, we may have her in New York uh, next, uh, next week. Yeah. Evelyn. That's the same thing. But anyway, I have a couple short ones. Uh, Secretary General going to the Queen's Jubilee uh, no. tomorrow. Is he sending messages and so uh, He will. Uh, I, I don't know if there's an official message, but the Secretary General only has uh, respect and admiration uh, for Queen Elizabeth. And, uh, sure. Uh, now, on the serious thing, um, the CAR, aid workers are attacked. Why is it since we don't have we can't announce who did it. Was it the Wagner group? Was it someone else? Because the aid workers surely know who attacked them. Well, I, I think most of these attacks, if not all, were done by various armed groups or people with guns. It's not always, you know, I mean, uh, not all people who commit these attacks wear jerseys, they wear team jerseys. So it's no, not always aid clear. No, workers often know who they well, are. They, they, they do, and maybe sometimes they don't, you know. I mean, what they do know is that they're being attacked. Uh, which group is behind it is not always that clear. Right, and I may have missed in the toing and froing over Michelle Bachelet's uh, visit to China. Uh, do we <laughs> expect a report? on her trip. Uh, you'd have to talk to, uh, to our human yeah, okay. rights uh, colleagues. Linda, and then go there. Thank you, Steph. Um, this is in regard to Ukraine. Earlier you mentioned the package deal that was being mm -hmm. uh, worked on in terms of getting Ukrainian exports out and getting Russian food and um, fertilizer out. I was just wondering how much progress has been made in this. I mean, has there been any movement in terms of country support for this? And finally, a package deal implies that there's two sides to it, and that you don't have one without the other. And so, I was just one, you know, just. I mean, a to package is exactly it that. Is. It's a package, right? Uh, I think we are uh, we are happy to see, you know, positive comments made publicly, you know, from uh, to various degrees, from uh, you know, to geographically, shall we say, from. Uh, from Moscow to Washington and, and points in between, right? Uh, but the devil is in the detail, especially in this, uh, in this instant. Uh, the Secretary General was as clear as he could be at this point, where he said, we've seen some progress, but we're not there yet. Yep. Thank you, Stephen. A group of uh, Israeli human rights organizations have uh, formally requested uh, to UN special rapporteurs to investigate the killing of our colleague Shirin Abu Akla. The letters sent to uh, UN special rapporteur on arbitrary killing and the UN <laughs> rapporteur on the occupied Palestinian territories. I know they are independent, but uh, what's your comment? Do you support the, their investigation or like that? You've kind of answered the question. Yes, the special rapporteurs are independent. It will be up to them to uh, to um, to respond. They are, while being independent, they're a very important uh, part of the human rights architecture within the UN system. Uh, I, I, I don't I don't know what they will respond. I don't know what they will offer. But our position remains the same: that we feel there needs to be a a, a credible. Uh, and transparent investigation into how your colleague was killed. Monsieur. Thank you, Stefan. Today, uh, the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavirov, uh, met with GCC foreign ministers, and he said uh, that uh, GCC members didn't follow the implementation of sanctions against Russia. My question, since there, is, there are no sanctions 
against uh, they are not following the sanctions against Russia. Can GCC countries be an option uh, for the UN to export uh, well, grain and fertilizer from Russia? Thank you. I mean, I think the sanctions you're talking about are um, bilateral sanctions, right? They're not Security Council sanctions. So it's not for me to uh, to comment. I think it is important for us to have the support of the international community in pushing the Secretary General's plan forward. And he's obviously, we, we're looking at all uh, all available uh, all available options. Okay, uh, thank you. I will go get uh, the ambassador, and I will see you tomorrow.